Hello, everyone, and welcome to NOAA's Omics webinar series. My name is Tracy Gill, and along with Catherine Egan, we are the co-hosts for this series. Before we get started, here are a few logistics, and most of this information is in the chat box. All attendees are muted, but you can enter your comments and questions into the chat box at any time. The presenters may address some questions during the presentation, but would prefer to answer most of them at the end. We also have 13 poll questions at the end that we hope you will participate in, and we will run the Q&A concurrent with those poll questions. There's big wind and rain in Maryland today, and if for some reason we lose connection and the webinar stops, we will try to reschedule and let you know when. If you lose connection, but we don't, we will share a recording and a PDF copy of the webinar within a few days. If you wanna to go to a full screen or larger slide view, look above the upper right corner of the slides and find the button that has a box with a bracket around it. That box button toggles the full screen view on and off. There are two ways to access live closed captioning. The first is to go to the CC icon above the slide deck, click on the pull down to the right and select show captions. A black box should pop up that will have the captioning and you may move and size that box to suit you. If you cannot access the closed captions through Adobe Connect, you will find a link to the closed captioning in the chat box. If you are interested in getting a PDF copy of the slides, a link to the recording and possibly a summary of the chat, we will send it out within a few days after the talk to all who registered. If you are not on the NOAA weekly science seminar list, but you'd like to be, please contact me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov and I will add you to the list. And many thanks to our captioner today for making this recording more accessible. And now I will pass the mic to Catherine Egan the OMICS coordinator in NOAA OAR's Ocean Portfolio with the OAR Office of Ocean Exploration. Catherine, Catherine is also the subcommittee co-lead for the NOAA OMICS Working Group. Catherine will introduce the OMICS series, today's topic, and our presenters. Catherine, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Tracy, and hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining today. Um, welcome to the NOAA OMIC seminar series. As Tracy stated, I am your co-host, Catherine Egan. I am the NOAA Research OMICS coordinator, and I sit in NOAA Ocean Exploration. OMICS, which is a suite of tools used to analyze DNA, RNA, proteins, and metabolites, has become a large priority here at NOAA in the last few years. We established this seminar series in an effort to increase transparency and collaboration and highlight the incredible omics-related research currently underway both within and outside NOAA. I'm happy to announce that this seminar series um, will now be made available on YouTube, YouTube and posted up on our omics website a few weeks after the webinar. I will drop a link to the website in the chat now so you can view past seminars and also register for our next seminar, which I will discuss at the end of the presentation. So normally the NOAA OMIC seminar series takes place on the third Wednesday of every month, but today we have a seminar for you all outside our regularly scheduled seminar series time. So with that, our speakers today are Mark Stokel and Jesse Osbell from the Rockefeller University. Their presentation is titled, Fishing for eDNA, How Much Water to Catch and Other Questions. So now I'll introduce Mark. Mark Stokel's research interests include environmental genomics, DNA barcoding, and visual representation of information. Dr. Sokol helped organize the early meetings that laid the foundation for DNA barcoding, a standardized method for rapid identification of animal and plant species. His DNA barcoding work with high school students has attracted wide attention, including front page articles in the, in the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. Since 2017, he has been helping develop eDNA as a technology for monitoring marine fish and other sea life. He published the first time series eDNA study of the Lower Hudson River Estuary in 2017 and helped organize the first national conference on marine eDNA held at the Rockefeller University in 2018. He recently led the largest eDNA bottom trawl study to date in collaboration with colleagues at Monmouth University and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Our other speaker today is Jesse Ospel. Jesse directs the Rockefeller University's program for the human environment, which aims to elaborate with the technical vision of a large, prosperous society that emits little harm and spares large amounts of land and sea for nature. 
Mr. Ossabel initiated and helped lead the Census of Marine Life, Barcode of Life Initiative, and International Quiet Ocean Experiment. In 2000, President Clinton appointed him to the President's Panel on Ocean Exploration. An adjunct scientist at HUI, he delivered the U.S. Naval Academy's 20, 2015 Michelson Lecture and hosted the 2016 National Ocean Exploration Forum. Mr. Ossabel serves on the Clean Ocean International Expert Group of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and on the NOAA's Science Advisory Board. So thank you so much, Mark and Jesse, for presenting today. I will now pass it off to Jesse to start. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks, Catherine. And let me say thank you to several other people within NOAA, uh, including Craig McLean, Cisco Werner, uh, Kelly Goodwin, uh, and uh, Tim Gallaudet, uh, who fostered uh, omics uh, uh, in earlier years. Uh, uh, there's, NOAA has a great omics roadmap. Get it funded. Uh, and uh, not least, let me thank Rick Spinrad. Rick invited uh, our group to prepare the chapter on eDNA e for his uh, book on the new blue economy, the Bible of the new blue economy. Uh, the book uh, from the Marine Technology Society with Lisa Hotelling, and I highly recommend that book and the chapter, of course, on, on uh, eDNA. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our partners, whom we'll mention uh, at, the, at the end of this talk, uh, from Monmouth University and the New Jersey Bureau of Marine Fisheries. Uh, this talk is a sequel to one that uh, Mark uh, led in August of 2020, which focused on the question of whether eDNA uh, works for abundance as well as diversity? The answer is yes. Uh, in fact, uh, you all just had a seminar a couple of weeks ago on uh, results about hake and hake abundance. Uh, again, very, very uh, encouraging. Well, uh, Mark uh, uh, and our group, we've now, we're now getting towards a thousand uh, samples that we've collected and analyzed uh, over the years. And uh, as we're doing this, of course, and uh, working with other people to uh, develop and spread uh, the, the method, uh, basic questions get asked over and over again. And one of them is, of course, how much water to collect? Uh, do I need uh, a half a liter or a liter, uh, five liters, 10 liters? Uh, how much should I filter? Uh, what's the effect of different kinds of filters? Uh, and then how much DNA do we actually need to analyze? How much do we actually need to sequence? And in the, in the talk that follows, Mark will share with you results, new results from the last year, never before shared, on uh, these very, very practical and important questions if the, if the method is to become adopted uh, and a standard and survive uh, regulatory and uh, judicial scrutiny. So we'll be sharing those uh, with you, uh, but let me just quickly remind you uh, that uh, eDNA has some very wonderful advantages. Uh, uh, that make it an incredible complement supplement uh, for our traditional methods. Uh, here you see a, a team of seven people out at sea sorting fish from a, a traditional trawl of the kind that the New Jersey Bureau of Marine Fisheries trawl does, uh, where we uh, uh, compare the results from a, a liter of water with large amounts of, uh, of water trawled. Uh, and the, the uh, trawling, of course, has become very sophisticated. And there are, and, it's a very good method. At the same time, uh, here are seven people uh, and using their hands, their eyes. Uh, there are people on the bridge. Uh, and of course, there are many days that one can't send out uh, a vessel like this. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, expensive and uh, time consuming. So if we can have methods that can be uh, used uh, uh, efficiently, cheaply, uh, and so forth, uh, uh, it's uh, it's really attractive. Uh, NOAA is always facing the question, uh, should it order new ships, new platforms, or drones? Uh, NOAA's OAMO is always facing this question. And I, I think after listening to our talk, uh, you'll see that obviously the, uh, the seesaw should start tilting from uh, the traditional platforms to uh, newer methods. Uh, the range of applications is large. Uh, fishing, uh, of course, the, the kind of work that uh, the Bureau, that the that, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service does, uh, surveys of all kinds. Aquaculture, uh, how is aquaculture changing the ecology uh, around it? Uh, resource extraction, uh, oil and gas, or uh, wind farms, how are these changing uh, their environments? 
uh, shipping, dredging, uh, bilge water, uh, ballast water, uh, effects of global warming, uh, efficacy of marine Jesse, we lost you. Okay. Now, can you hear me again? Yes. Yes. Where? Where? What was the last? I'm sorry. You talked was... about efficacy of marine protection. Okay. 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 Then restoration uh, is restoration working, and then basic uh, research and exploration, unexplored environments, uh, of course. So, uh, eDNA can aid in all of these things. It, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's not a narrow method. It's a method that can apply to almost everything uh, that NOAA does, as well as other uh, uh, agencies, uh, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, Navy, uh, Coast Guard, uh, EPA, and so forth. Let me, uh, uh, just before turning it over to Mark, mention three bits of news. Uh, we will be having the second national workshop on marine eDNA hosted uh, by the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. Uh, Steve Weisberg, Susanna Theroux in the lead uh, out in Costa Mesa in uh, near Los Angeles, Long Beach. Uh, uh, you know, the first few days of February and uh, next year. Uh, uh, it's an in-person conference still as of now and uh, we also uh, will be streaming a lot of that. So please uh, visit the website for the conference, and we hope there'll be wide participation. Uh, second, I wanted to mention that there is a new journal. Uh, those of you, especially the academics, uh, publishing is important, uh, memorializing uh, uh, what we've learned, and there is now a dedicated journal on environmental eDNA, so, uh, so uh, consider submitting papers there, as well as, of course, to the other places that uh, are, are uh, hosting the growing literature. And finally, uh, the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, OBIS, uh, just a few weeks ago for the first time integrated uh, uh, genetic data, genomic data, barcode data, uh, and eDNA data into uh, its Whatware database uh, hosted uh, at Flanders uh, in Belgium. Uh, and for a long time we've wondered could there be an integrated database that has the traditional uh, uh, kinds of identifications uh, together with the genomic information and uh, OBIS took the leap, and uh, with help from, from uh, Francisco Chavez and folks at Ambari, uh, OBIS now uh, can uh, accept and uh, archive uh, your, your data, uh, the genomic data, as well as uh, the, the uh, traditionally identified uh, uh, taxonomic data, uh, allowing, of course, uh, over the long run, tremendous accumulation and the ability to do synoptic analyses. So lots is happening, and let me now turn it over to Mark on some of the latest results from our lab. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Jesse and uh, Tracy, Catherine, and uh, thanks to Noah for this opportunity. I'm going to share what we've learned about counting fish with environmental DNA. Uh, analyzing environmental DNA starts with collecting water, uh, filtering it to trap uh, suspended uh, particles, and, and then extracting the DNA from that material. I should say most of what you uh, collect is bacterial, but in this, uh, what we trap in the filter are cells or bits of cells that are shed by fish or other organisms that you're analyzing. Uh, after extracting the DNA, then DNA analysis, either by metabarcoding, which looks at multiple species all at once, or by single species assays. Uh, all of the data that I'm going to show uses metabarcoding. Uh, we use broad range primers that amplify the DNA of any vertebrate uh, or mitochondrial DNA of any vertebrate uh, uh, that's in the sample. Uh, do uh, sequence that mixture with next gen sequencing on an aluminum MySeq, and then use bioinformatics to count how many reads of each sequence there are and to match those to a genetic library so we can identify what species uh, they came from. Uh, aquatic eDNA lasts a few days. It seems to be lost through degradation or dispersal. And the short-lived signal means it reflects nearby animals or animals uh, that were nearby recently. 
Okay, so how much water to catch for eDNA? Uh, we researched this question by comparing a trawl survey uh, to what we learned from eDNA. And this is uh, uh, a survey that was done in collaboration with the New Jersey Ocean Trawl Survey, uh, and colleagues at Monmouth University. And this is a, a long established survey. So they piggybacked onto this, uh, collecting water. This shows for August 2019, the black dots are the, are the sites where uh, a trawl was conducted off the New Jersey coast and the red dots are where the trawl plus we collected water. So for each survey month, like in August, there were 39 trawls. Uh, there were, and we got 20 water samples each month. We picked uh, 10 sites, collected two liters at each site, one at the surface and one at the bottom. And if we put the data together, so we uh, summed the data from the trawl for that month, and we summed all the eDNA data uh, for that month, uh, we got about a roughly 70% concordance between the trawl and the eDNA for species detection, for relative abundance, and for seasonality. And I'll show you some of that data in a minute. So 40 trawls, more or less 20 water samples. I, I think we can say our bottom line is about a liter per trawl site is going to give you about the same information in terms of occurrence and abundance as, as you're getting from the trawl, at least in this environment. Uh, obviously, this may differ in other environments. And it's fortunate that a liter seems to be enough because, as I'll talk later, for practical reasons, it's hard to analyze uh, volumes larger than that. But this seems to work pretty well. Uh, we like eDNA because a little bit of water tells us a lot. From the trawl study, uh, the number of fish species that we detected by eDNA in one liter of water was as many or more than the number of fish species in one trawl. And a trawl sifts through 60 million liters of water. So 60 million liters of water for comparison, that would be enough to fill a football field up to the Gold Coast up to the goalposts. Uh, so uh, fish then are very patchy and you have to go through a lot of water uh, to catch them. The eDNA is relatively speaking, it's much more spread around. Uh, comparison to the trawl helps us validate that what we're seeing with the eDNA is biologically meaningful. Uh, this is from the paper uh, this is looking at eDNA reads uh, to trawl weight uh, over the course of the uh, survey year, so January, June, August, and November. And for uh, each of these examples here, you can see windowpane, flounder, most abundant in January, smooth dogfish in June, black sea bass, August, the anchovy, November. And you can see that the, the relative, the pattern of seasonality is really quite similar. Uh, for all the species, about 70% of them, the month that it was most abundant by eDNA was also most abundant by trawl. So that's, uh, that's reassuring. And uh, if you look at relative abundance within a month, so this is data from August 2019, Again, the eDNA looks like it's telling us useful information. So this compares eDNA reads on a log scale to trawl uh, weight uh, on a log scale. And the, up here at the top, so we have three species that, that were the most abundant by the trawl, clear nose skate, striped sea robin, and bull nose ray. They're also the most abundant by eDNA. And down here, species that were uh, uncommon uh, by the trawl, hog choker, lion seahorse, and red cornetfish. These were also the least abundant by eDNA. And from this study, we'd say that the reeds and the weight on a log scale, they're roughly proportional to about over 100,000 fold range. Uh, and this is the uh, correlation here between, the, uh, uh, between those two values. Uh, and we got some more data just added to the paper. Uh, this is, uh, the, uh, again, supports it. It's always nice when you add more data and it's, it, you get the same result. Uh, so here is, again, comparing log reads to log weight. 
This is for uh, the month, uh, the four survey months that were in 2019 plus January 2020. Each dot is one species in one month. And uh, again, we see uh, a nice correlation between the two. And it's actually a little bit stronger if you look at the R squared value here than it was in the uh, data that we published. This is 0 0.59, this is 0 0.71. Uh, it also strengthened the relationship between reads and an allometric index. This is calculated from weight and, and uh, number of individuals or more details in the paper. Uh, so adding in the new data, we get R squared of 0.77, which is better than you get just with the weight alone. And this 0.77 is better than what we got uh, <clears throat> with the four months uh, data. So I think this is a real result. And uh, so we're confident that there is really a relationship between eDNA reads and trawl weight. Uh, so we've been thinking about how to improve this. Those are, the results are nice, but uh, uh, what can we do to make it better or easier? Uh, so this is uh, our protocol, which is really uh, pretty typical, starting with a liter of water. We filter to concentrate the particulates. We're using a 0.45 micron filter. We extract the DNA with a kit. We end up with a DNA in 100 microliters. We're amplifying uh, that uh, the 12S target gene, which is commonly used for vertebrates, uh, do library preparation, and then next-gen sequencing. And our standard way we do this, we get about 100,000 reads for library, and then we do bioinformatic analysis on that. So what I'm going to show you is new data, uh, looking at if we change the input DNA, uh, the primer concentrations, if we use fish-specific versus vertebrate-specific primers, different number of PCR cycles. If we add an exogenous standard, what do we learn from that? And also sequencing depth. Uh, can we make this protocol is good, but can we make it better? So a big thing we found is the D amount of DNA you put in the reaction is really important. So if we put in less DNA, we get fewer species. And by less, I mean uh, our starting amount is five microliters, which is 1 20th of the DNA that we get from one liter of water. Uh, and that's typical of other studies. What we tried was, okay, we start with five microliters, then we did fourfold dilutions out to uh, one sixteen thousandth of the DNA. And this looks at number of species that we got from a library prepared from each of these black. The black line is the number of species. So from this sample, you can see each time we diluted it, there's a step down in the number of species. Uh, uh, here's, we did the same thing with a trawl sample from January 2020. There are fewer species in January. But again, with each dilution, we get fewer species. Uh, uh, one way you can look at this is that there must be at least 1,000 copies of eDNA in this uh, sample, and there must be at least 256 copies in this sample. One of the other observations is that what's shown in blue, which are the reads, there's the scale over here. Even when you put in much less DNA, like 164th, we still get about the same number of reads. Uh, and we knew that, but this is just a striking demonstration of that. Uh, so the, the assay is giving you relative uh, abundance, but it's not telling you absolute abundance. And we get that same sort of stability of the reads out to a 164th dilution with this sample here. Uh, if we look at the same data, but we look at individual species, this shows you what's going on. And as you start out with the undiluted sample and you go through the dilutions, you lose the rare species. So this black-cheeked tonguefish was the least uh, abundant in terms of reeds, and we didn't, it didn't show up in any of the other libraries. And at each dilution, you're losing the low reed uh, samples until at the very end, <clears throat> we're only left with weak fish uh, DNA, which started out as the most abundant. And you can see, even though there's much less uh, DNA in this sample, the weak fish reads are about the same. So same pattern with this New Jersey trawl sample. The low reed species, seaboard goby, these drop out. 
as you put in less and less DNA, the more abundant ones persist. So this is one thing you can say is that reads, this makes sense that reads are proportional to eDNA copies, uh, or relative reads are. So when you, when you put in less DNA, you're losing some of the low read uh, species. And again, an illustration that reports relative and not absolute concentration. If we go in the other direction, we add more DNA, we get more species. So our standard amount is five microliters. We tried adding 20 microliters and then doing the amplification. These are the species here that are in common. Each, uh, there are five samples here. Each uh, circle is one species from one of the uh, samples. And uh, so you amplify it once, you amplify it again. These are uh, fairly well correlated, but we also picked up a lot of additional species here. They're shown here with a 20 microliter sample. And same thing, we took five samples from January 2020. When we do a, a library with 20 microliters, we get a lot more new species. We also get some that were only showed up in the five microliter uh, library, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, most of the new ones that show up are low read species, so they're below a thousand reads. This is a thousand here, uh, and if that's a very statistically significant, we call these singles, the blue ones. Most of the singles are fewer than a thousand reads, uh, whereas most of the shared ones are more. And similarly, in this sample here, again, it, it makes sense if what we're detecting variably here are eDNAs that are present in low copy number low copy number generating low reads. For this to occur, our interpretation of this is that uh, what we're seeing is really a Poisson distribution or the law of small numbers. I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Uh, but we think that's the limiting factor in uh, detecting uh, species. So you put in more DNA, you get more species. If you do the same amount of DNA, five microliters, five microliters, this is 10 samples, uh, from August uh, uh, trawl, the shared ones show a good correlation, but you pick up a lot of uh, new species when you reamplify, and you lose a lot. So these are ones only in the first library. These are ones only in the second. This got 43 additional detections and 37 additional detections here. Uh, and again, most of these are low read uh, species. I, one other thing to point out here is the correlation is bet, is uh, is tighter up at the uh, wait a second up at the top. Uh, if you have high reads, the correlation is tighter than when you get, get down into low reads. Okay, so how many copies of eDNA are there? Uh, so we thought, well, we should add an exogenous standard. Other people have done this. Uh, thought it would be uh, fun to use ostrich DNA. We got ostrich, these are dog treats, uh, ostrich, which you can or order. Uh, we extracted DNA from that. We amplified uh, a 700 so base pair piece of the 12S gene. This is a schematic of the vertebrate 12S gene. This is the size of our ostrich amplicon. This is our meta barcoding target right here, the uh, ECO 110 base pair target. Uh, a lot of people are also targeting my fish for vertebrates. That's immediately adjacent. There's our ostrich amplicon. Uh, we can use qubit and figure out how many copies of DNA there are. So then we add a known amount of uh, copies uh, to our eDNA sample, which we don't know how many copies there are, and then see, relatively speaking, how many reads are there. Uh, so here's some of the uh, results. Uh, and just to go through this, uh, <clears throat> these are four different samples. A trawl sample, one, two from January trawl, a habitat survey, and two different habitat survey samples. So for each of these samples, uh, we did uh, six amplifications using five microliters of DNA each time, but adding different amounts of ostrich DNA to it, starting with 60 million copies, 600, these are hundredfold dilutions, 600,000, 6,060, and 0.6, and none. Uh, so same thing, five microliters in each 
from the uh, eDNA sample and then decreasing amounts of ostrich DNA. So what do we see? Well, if, the, if you add a lot of ostrich DNA, you suppress, you don't detect any of the fish. And that's true for all of these uh, samples. When you get down to 6,000 copies of ostrich DNA, then the fish, you start to see the fish uh, reads. And uh, we can, and if you put in 60 copies, then uh, the relatively speaking, the fish reads are gonna take up more of the uh, space. And that's what we see for each of these. So 6,000 versus 60s, 6,000 versus 60. Uh, from this, you can, uh, we, one we can see are reads proportional to eDNA copies. And uh, the answer is they're pretty good. If the index here, if you compare these two, should be 100, and it's pretty close to 100. And we can also, from this, say how many copies of eDNA are in this five microliters, and we get about average something around 500 copies uh, in our, according to this, uh, in our five microliters of extract. And that fits with what we saw with the dilution series, where we said there are a minimum of 1,000 or a minimum of 256. So uh, this is giving us an idea, at least in these samples, how many copies of fish DNA there are. It, and it's, it's less than I thought there were going to be. Uh, OK, I already went over this uh, part of it with the ostrich uh, reads. When you decrease the ostrich, you start to see the fish. You can calculate the fish index and uh, figure out how many uh, <coughs> copies of uh, fish eDNA there are. The last thing I'd point out is that even when there's an excess of ostrich DNA in these 6,000 uh, libraries with 6,000 copies of ostrich DNA, we're detecting most of the fish species. Black line here is fish species. And so uh, there's room in the assay. It has a dynamic range. It's not infinite. If you put in 60 million, you don't detect the fish. But you can have a, this is about a tenfold excess of, of an exogenous DNA, uh, and you're still detecting most all of the species. So uh, I think uh, the assay is not limited, at least in our environment, by dynamic range. So here's our uh, model of what we think is going on with our uh, samples uh, based on the, whether we detect it or not and what the eDNA concentration is. So if you have 100 microliters of DNA that you, you purified from one liter of water, some of the DNAs are common and some of them are rare. If you're taking a five microliter aliquot of that to do amplification on, uh, Sometimes you're going to get the rare ones, like here, and sometimes you're not. And if we do the math uh, based on uh, the law of small numbers or Poisson distribution, we can say, roughly speaking, if the eDNA is present in more than 100 copies per liter, and we do this kind of assay, we use five microliters to, and we do one amplification, we're going to detect it every time we amplify. Uh, there are another set of eDNAs if they're present at lower concentrations per liter. Some of the time we're going to detect it, like here, and some of the time we're not. And there probably are eDNAs in the ocean that are uh, rarer than this, that you're very rarely or you're really never going to detect them if you only collect one liter of water. Uh, so. If you think of metabarcoding, it's a molecular version of an ecological survey. All survey methods require more effort to monitor uncommon taxa, and that's, that's what we're seeing here. That's <clears throat> what we're illustrating in this model. I should point out that eDNA rarity, it could be because the organisms are rare, but it could also be decreased shedding, uh, increased degradation, or dispersal. Uh, what about some uh, of the other changes? Deeper sequencing, uh, we say it found some additional species, it, it, uh, fewer than we might have uh, thought. So our standard sequencing with MySeq, we get 100,000 reads per library. 
we ran the same set of libraries on HiSeq, we get 20 million reads per library. So 20 times, uh, uh, or I do the math right, but anyway, uh, as many reads, uh, this should be 2 million, sorry, uh, 20 times as many reads. Uh, and if you compare the HiSeq reads to the MySeq reads, uh, they're very well correlated. That's reassuring because we put in the same sample. And the high seek picked up a few more species. Uh, so it, it did, and, and these are at the low end of the uh, range, uh, both by high seek and my seek. Uh, if we look back at the FASTQ files, those, most of those species were actually present in the FASTQ files uh, before we put them through the bioinformatic pipeline. Uh, so maybe we could change the bioinformatic pipeline and recover these, but uh, uh, they, they were filtered out by our bioinformatic pipeline. Uh, uh, so these, that's their present. If we look at other samples from the same study area uh, where maybe the concentrations are a little higher, uh, these species showed up. So among a large set of samples from one area, uh, the high seek didn't uh, do anything, didn't add any new, didn't discover any new species. They showed up in one or the other of the my seek uh, samples. So I'd say deeper sequencing, it's a modest benefit. And at least in our environment, it's not routinely helpful. Uh, some things really didn't make any difference. We tried more PCR cycles. This is with four habitat survey samples. Uh, log scale, uh, each of these is, is a species. And uh, we got some additional species, same number of singles with 40 cycles as with 50 cycles. So same number of species, slightly different set of species. And that's just because if you reamplify, you pick up more of these low read species. So that, that wasn't helpful. Uh, we thought that modifying the primer concentration might help because uh, this shows the primary amplification. Here's our standard primer concentration, 200 nanomolar. If you put increase the primer concentration, you generate more product. And if you decrease the primer concentration, uh, you, you can see here you get uh, less product. Uh, so thought, oh, this is good. We can get more species this way. But it's it, they're the same number of species in each of these. So. Here's one sample starting with 800 nanomolar down to 50. So even though we're not generating a lot of PCR product uh, with 50 nanomolar primers, we're already amplifying all the primers that are in the sample, uh, all the species that are in the sample. And we tried fish selective primers. One problem with the RIAS primers we use is uh, they often they amplify a lot of other vertebrate DNA specifically human DNA. So blue is fish, green is other vertebrate, and, and uh, gray is other non-vertebrates, which they sometimes amplify. And we compared that, uh, so we tried re-amplifying these same samples with a modified MyFish primer set. Uh, and we modified it because MyFish primers, if you use these, they often, they amplify a lot of bacterial DNA. So we modified the reverse primer, so it uh, didn't amplify bacterial DNA. They're already specific for fish. Uh, so much more specificity here. We're not amplifying uh, either other vertebrates or other, but uh, no consistent difference in the number of species. Uh, probably no benefit is, well, could you, could you get the thing to work better by pooling? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to get my uh, pointer here. Uh, what about pooling multiple small volumes? At the beginning, I thought, well, just collect small amount from lots of different places, but it's really the same thing. If the fish's DNA is present at a certain concentration, your chance of capturing it, let's say for this concentration in a liter is 10%. It's the same thing if you take 10 different aliquots, uh, you end up with the same percentage. Uh, this is important because the maximum filterable volume for us in nearshore samples is about a liter. 
this shows volume filtered uh, versus time. Once you get past about a liter, it starts to really slow down. And if you wanted to filter, you just could not filter five times as much. You couldn't filter five liters. Uh, so you could, uh, if you want to improve detection, you've either got to amplify a larger proportion of the DNA sample, do multiple amplifications, or collect multiple liters of water, or use some other method entirely. Uh, so uh, these are our uh, highlights. Uh, I'd say one, a fish eDNA reads are roughly proportional to trawl biomass over a 100,000 fold range. A larger proportion of a DNA sample improves species detection and read re reproducibility. You can use an exogenous standard to count the absolute amount of eDNA. And the law of small numbers limits detection and quantification of uncommon DNA. And uh, our take home messages, one, that the one liter per trawl site gives you similar information at, in terms of occurrence and abundance information as a trawl. The current protocol, a typical protocol, it's re already reliable for common fish species. Uncommon taxa may need more effort. Either you're gonna need to filter a larger water volume, get multiple samples, larger PCR input, multiple amplification. Now, this is a feature of all survey methods. Uh, if things are rare, you need to do more work to find them. And it's, uh, it's true with uh, eDNA as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jesse, you can take over. Yes, yes. Uh... Mark, uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, the, uh, I, I just wanted to come back to uh, the end by reminding us of the applications. There have been some really good questions in the chat. And uh, it's important to keep in mind that for some uh, of the applications, uh, for many applications, we're really mostly interested in what's relatively common, uh, as in uh, uh, a lot of the fishery surveys. Uh, in, some, in some situations, you're going to be interested in something very rare. Uh, is a, a new species arriving uh, and so forth. So the, uh, uh, we feel we're making progress in moving towards protocols, uh, eDNA protocols, that could be appropriate for the different contexts. Uh, uh, and so I would say for those, uh, the, uh, the people who are uh, the, uh, on the seminar, uh, think think about the questions at the outset that you want answered. Uh, if you're interested uh, in the uh, in, again in in mainly in abundance of relatively abundant things, uh, the sampling strategy uh, one kind of sampling strategy may uh, emerge. If you're interested in looking for something extremely extremely rare way out on the tail. Uh, you'll need a somewhat different strategy. Uh, but as Mark said, that's, that's the case with nets or scuba or any other method, uh, 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 baited traps. So uh, one needs to, obviously, we, uh, one will customize and, and tailor in certain ways. Uh, the, in closing, I wanted to mention one other thing. This is a, a question that uh, Tracy raised. What about communities? Uh, and this, uh, I think, Mark and I really feel is uh, one of the exciting frontiers uh, for uh, the next, uh, for, the, for the coming period that I think we, we help, hope to work on. Uh, is there a kind of collective uh, DNA fingerprint uh, uh, of the species? Uh, this is something, of course, that in microbiology and microbiomes, uh, people are uh, quite accustomed to. But uh, uh, we think, as you could see, there are these profiles that seem to emerge uh, uh, of, of species, and uh, the, uh, the eDNA can also be a, a fantastic, quick, uh, effective, accurate way of, uh, of quickly characterizing an entire community of, of uh, fishes in this case, but of uh, more vertebrates or, or other groups as well. Uh, so, uh, we, we think the, the horizon is very high uh, for the method. Uh, 
Uh, a leader gives an enormous amount of information. It's a kind of Goldilocks story to begin with. Uh, we've, when we spoke to you uh, in August uh, a year ago, we said, well, you know, if DNA lasted uh, weeks and months in the water, everything would be everywhere. If it broke up into short pieces in, uh, in five minutes, then it would be, you'd need to catch it immediately, as with a net. Uh, but this, the fact that it seems to last uh, about a day uh, in general uh, is perfect from the point of view of uh, most, most uh, survey methods. And we think uh, this, this, uh, the goodness of the leader is another kind of Goldilocks situation. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, th this amount that's feasible to, to uh, filter in an hour, let's say, or even less, uh, uh, gives you so much information, and that there are, I'd say, diminishing returns, except possibly for the very rare species, uh, after, after the, uh, the leader uh, also, uh, again, uh, makes the, lead, the, the method powerful, and uh, we really think uh, ready for prime time. So on that note, uh, uh, let me turn it uh, back to Catherine, who I think will, will uh, monitor the Q&A uh, and also share with you some polling questions. Yes, and let me, of course, also uh, again thank uh, our Monmouth colleagues, Jason uh, Adolph and Keith Dunton, uh, Greg Hinks and Stacey Van Morder from the New Jersey DEP, from the Bureau of Marine Fisheries, and Zach Charlotte Powers, also from Rockefeller. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Jesse and Mark. I'm seeing a lot of comments here in the chat about how you put together a really good presentation here and, and presented a really interesting study. So thank you both. Um, Tracy, do you want to bring up the poll questions now? Okay, great. Thank you. So Jesse and Mark put together um, 13 poll questions for the audience. Um, so we're going to just leave, so there's two pages of polls, and we're going to leave the first page up for a few minutes to give you all some time to read through them. Um, so I really encourage you all to take some time to do that. And while that is happening, uh, we're going to have uh, Mark and Jesse answer some of these questions here. So if I'm looking at the chat correctly, we're going to go all the way up to... I believe uh, Courtney had a question which was answered by somebody else, but I'm going to read it here and see if uh, Mark or Jesse wants to come in. So this is from Courtney. When conducting the trawl leader comparison, the slide mentioned two leaders taken at each site within one leader at the surface and one leader at the bottom. One leader was sufficient for the findings. Did it matter if the one leader was from the surface or the bottom? Uh, uh, this is Mark. I can answer that. It, uh, for our samples, no. Uh, we were surprised. But uh, the deepest uh, part of the New Jersey trawl is 30 meters. Uh, so uh, there are obviously other regions you could sample. Uh, but there, uh, there was not a, any consistent difference in species uh, number uh, or distribution between surface and bottom samples. At any given site, uh, the correlation of the reads between a surface and a bottom uh, site were, was quite high uh, and as compared to comparing across sites. So depth didn't make a difference. Yeah, we've talked about this uh, a fair amount, and of course, on the, on a shelf, the the water is likely to be pretty well mixed. There could be aquatic settings where you have a lot of stratification uh, in freshwater uh, or in in particular uh, marine settings. Uh, and of course, you, it's important to know something about the 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 the, the, uh, the physics of the water in that sense. Uh, but uh, in in most of the uh, in most cases on a shelf setting, especially in a in a summer, where, you know, the summer when there's warmth and convection and so forth, uh, uh, the water is likely to be pretty well mixed, and the DNA is as well. Uh, so uh, that's a, a, you know again, it's an aid to the method. All right, thank you both. So the next one I have here is from Colleen. Why is the species slash sample lower with no dilution? Uh, this is Mark. I, I'm not sure which slide. Uh, uh, 
Our undiluted samples, there are five microliters, which is our standard amount. That gives us the most species. Uh, uh, the reads uh, went up when we diluted it, but not the uh, number of species. Okay, we have one here from Ramon. Do you think that some of the extra species detection in the high seek are actually sample misassignment, aka tag jumping, from the other samples in the same run? Uh, tag jumping is always possible. We have a threshold that we filter out uh, uh, some of that. Uh, there is some low level tag jumping. I didn't, the one, but I, I guess the short answer is I don't think that's the cause, uh, but I can't prove that. We've looked at the tags on the ones that, uh, whether they're shared between, uh, you know, one sample where it's very abundant and one where it's not. So uh, the short answer is I don't think that's an issue. Thank you. And Tracy has switched over to the second page of poll questions, so feel free to get started on that while we go through some of these other questions here. Um, so jumping around, we have uh, our next unanswered question is from Kristen. The correlation between trawl weight and read number looked looser at the low end, i.e. rarer species. Can you speak to how the relationship changes with respect to abundance or weight? Uh, yes, I agree that the correlations, both eDNA to trawl and eDNA to uh, eDNA are lower at the lower end. Part of it, I think, is it's a math problem. When you get things are rare, the variability is higher. Uh, and I think that's true for the trawl as, as well as uh, uh, for the eDNA. Uh, so, I think it's just inherent in when you're measuring things that are rare. All right, thank you. And I apologize, it seems like a lot of these questions are getting answered in the chat, so excuse me, I'm trying to keep up with the great questions that are happening here and the, and the good conversation as well. Um, so we have a couple more minutes left for questions. Our next one looking here is from uh, Danielle. Can we analyze eDNA across different sites and geographies? Can you speak a little more about considerations for spatial assessment? I mean, you could, I'm not sure what the question is. You certainly can uh, make comparisons across sites. We're interested in uh, looking at uh, sense sort of boundaries of, of sites. Uh, there's a lot of consistency in a given month uh, which in terms of the very abundant species, but uh, in the trawl survey, but you know, what if we go into the bay, uh, it, we get different species and where's the border of that? So certainly an application for eDNA. Yeah, I, I might add to that, uh, Ryan Kelly and some of our other colleagues on the West Coast, uh, Eileen Allen, have done careful studies uh, looking at diffusion and nearby tidal pools and things like that. And there's certainly more work to be done uh, on the close-in uh, spatial questions. Uh, you know, if you are, uh, and also how those relate to the physical oceanography. For example, uh, we want to do more testing, let's say, just after a storm uh, to see how the, you know, if there are uh, winds and uh, stronger, uh, uh, stronger movements uh, of, of the water, how that might uh, affect uh, the localization. Uh, so I think looking in more detail in both, uh, in both space and time is a frontier. Another example, you know, we just had the, uh, the uh, leak from the pipeline, uh, the cracked pipeline off uh, Los Angeles. And this is, a kind, this is a method where one could go out uh, each day, let's say once a day for 15 or 30 days after a leak. Uh, and it's affordable and feasible to collect water nearby day by day to watch, uh, watch what happens. Uh, and that's something that one simply couldn't do with the alternate, alternate methods. Uh, so 
there, I think there are a lot of these, as Mark said, a lot of these, the, the, the borders in space and time, uh, there's a, a, a lot more work that we can do and a lot to be learned by, uh, by, by defining interesting questions uh, of that. All right, thank you both. So we'll take questions for maybe like two or three more minutes here. We, we have a bunch more coming in. Um, our next one is from Luke. Are your quality scores from the high seat continuous or bend? This may impact ASD calling and data too. Uh, uh, this is Mark. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, uh, I'd have to ask uh, our co-author of Zach, Charlotte Powers, is a, does, uh, <clears throat> did the bioinformatics. If you email me, I'll, I'll, see, if, uh, I'll see if I can find out can send you the answer. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, if you want to drop your email in the chat here, uh, please feel free to do so. I'm going to kind of, so we have two questions up here next, one from Dina and one from Meredith that I think are similar. Um, so the question from Dina is, the rare species in both eDNA and trawls seem to also be smaller, e.g. the cornet fish and the seahorse versus skates and rays. Common sense says smaller animals uh, slash surface area would shed less DNA. Are there any counterexamples like high weights and large DNA amounts of small fish? And I'm going to read Meredith's question here too. We occasionally have single species that can swamp the signal due to their biology. Do you ever see this in your samples and does that noise disappear across a wider biomass uh, scale? i.e. the 100,000-fold discussed? Uh, those are both very good questions. We did look at the allometric index that I uh, went over a little bit quickly. It is discussed further in the ICES journal marine science paper. Uh, and it, uh, it takes into account, you could think of it as a surface area index. Uh, when animals get small, their surface area is larger in proportion to their uh, weight than when they're big. Uh, there are, uh, I, I, uh, one of, if you say something that's at the low end in terms of weight, uh, that would be maybe Atlantic sturgeon. There are a few caught in the trawl, and if they catch them, they're very big. Uh, so we, in terms of the second question, but so I think size is very important. And weight is an easy thing to correlate with eDNA, but it, maybe some other index. Uh, and there's data from uh, freshwater systems uh, uh, that some kind of allometric index will give you a better correlation. Uh, we haven't had problems with single species swamping the signal, but that may just be a feature of the environment that we're in. If I might just add about uh... The, uh, again, about rarity. Mark, Mark's comment about thinking about causes of rarity, uh, this is uh, for Dina, it's really important because, again, things can be rare in different ways. Uh, uh, you know, there are occasionally beluga whales in uh, New York Bight. Uh, they may only be present three days a year. That's one kind of rarity. Uh, another kind of rarity is something that exists, it's there all the time, but very few kilos. And again, one needs different kind of sampling strategies uh, depending on, on uh, uh, what, the, what the challenge may be. Uh, and here again, it's important uh, to have other, uh, to bring to bear other knowledge uh, from, uh, uh, from biology, from ecology, from ethology, uh, and from physical oceanography. Uh, so uh, finally, eDNA doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's a very powerful tool but it's much more powerful when you match it with something you may know about the life cycle of a particular species, for example. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Mark and Jesse. It looks like we're in the last minute of our seminar today, so I'm going to wrap things up here. Mark and Jesse did put their emails um, in the chat, so I really encourage you all to please follow up with them if you have any additional questions. You can also follow up with me at our new uh, NOAA Omics email address, which I put here in the chat if you have any further questions or thoughts about NOAA Omics or our seminar series. 
So with that, I wanted to thank you all and our presenters for joining us today. As I stated earlier, the NOAA Omics Seminar Series normally takes place on the third Wednesday of every month at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Our next seminar will take place on November 17th and is titled Connecting Microbes, Phytoplankton, and Oceanography in the California Current with eDNA and Metagenomes. This will be presented by Dr. Nastasia Payton with NOAA AOML. The registration for that is up on our NOAA Omics website. So please register, and I hope I will see you there at the next one. Thank you, everyone, and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you.